You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, and welcome to Sustainably Geeky, episode 28. Today, we are joined by two guests again. Um, we have Cliff and Chloe here with us. We're going to be talking about dark skies. Um, Jen is one of our regulars. She's also with us, and Chris will be joining us in just a little bit. So uh, Cliff Kaplan is a program manager for the Hill Country Alliance. He works in 17 counties of the Texas Hill Country to help communities preserve the region's natural resources, including its night skies. Cliff holds degrees from New York University and the University of Texas at Austin. And Chloe Crumley is the Outreach and Engagement Program Coordinator for the Texas Regional Office of the National Parks Conservation Association. Growing up in Texas, Chloe gained a love of nature, culture, and history, and works to preserve all of those values in the national parks. So if you listened to our episode last month, you'll remember that we had uh, two guests from the National Parks Conservation Association, or N NPCA. Um, and so Chloe works closely with um, both Dallas and Alan uh, at NPCA, and they um, came up with the idea to do a show on dark skies. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, and they also work closely with the Hill Country Alliance, which is what, who Cliff is with. Um, so with that, uh, I guess I'll pass it on to you guys to kind of talk a little bit more about your organization and, and you know how and why you're involved in this cause. Okay. Um, yeah, that was a, a perfect introduction. Um, so the National Parks Conservation Association is a 100 year old uh, advocacy nonprofit. Um, they work to preserve and protect the national parks for current and future generations. And so that is kind of a myriad of things. So that could be dark skies, development, clear air, recreation, um, kind of protecting the parks and their values. Um, and so Going back to that introduction, I think the national parks really convey that message of there's the environment, there's cultural heritage, and there's history. Um, and actually, Texas has 16 national park sites, and they represent all of those things. And so it's kind of magical to see. And one of those areas we really tried to get more into is that dark skies aspect, because you think of it actually covers all three of those pieces. Um, the environment, you're able to see the, the value of the pristine night sky. Um, it's also good for the wildlife. Um, it values of the cultural heritage. When you think of the LBJ National Historical Park site, you want to be able to sit on the porch like LBJ once did and look at the night sky. Um, you want to be able to be one of the soldiers at Fort Davis and see what it looks like to be in the middle of nowhere, Texas, um, preserving, preserving the trail of travelers and seeing what it looks like to look up and see that Milky Way. Um, and of course, it's just the heritage and history of Texas. I'm um, kind of the idea of what wrapped around um, the dark skies, our Lone Star State, um, has this star, of course, on our flag. It's in our, lots of our songs and our mottos. I um, just so want to make sure that that is really represented in our national parks as well. Um, so I'm happy to be able to start preserving that and talk a little about it more today. Great. And I'm assuming um, you guys, you do a lot of work in Texas, but this is something that NPCA does all over the country, correct? This kind of yes. work on dark skies? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mojave Desert, places in Utah. Um, so they're working to preserve that because I think as you see in lots of maps and it's talked about constantly, it's that moving the light pollution keeps getting worse and worse. And so how can we yeah. kind of make this a larger conversation? Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to hear more about that. Uh, Cliff, tell us about Hill Country Alliance and the work you guys are doing uh, with NPCA and others to preserve our night skies. Sure. So... Um, so the Hill Country Alliance is uh, 15 years old. Um, we were formed by a group of neighbors uh, just outside of Austin who were concerned about the impacts that Austin sprawl was going to have on um, the environment where they lived in western Travis County. And um, pretty soon that group of neighbors uh, grew to cover 17 counties of the Texas Hill Country. Um, we work on all kinds of issues related to the preservation of natural resources, um, from the, you know, the spring-fed creeks and streams, um, to the prairies and wildflowers and woodlands uh, of the Hill Country and the night skies. Also, um, the vibrant um, communities that both rural and urban across the region um, but focusing specifically on night skies, Chloe spoke about sort of the importance of the night skies to Texas heritage and to human heritage. 
um, really eloquently. Um, I'd just add a, a few additional reasons um, that we do night sky preservation work. So one is, is the context, uh, Jennifer, that you mentioned of, or uh, actually that Chloe mentioned of, of growth in, in the country and how that is impacting the spread of light pollution. So in the Texas Hill Country, we're positioned right at the edge of um, two major urban centers, Austin and San Antonio, which are kind of melding into each other along I-35. And that population urban, you know, that population center along I-35 is spreading westward. Actually, if you look at a map of, um, of the U.S. at night, like a, a satellite image of mm -hmm. the U.S. at night, you can see uh, very clearly there's a bright line going down the middle of the map. On, on one side of it, there's lots of light pollution. And on the other side, on the west side, there's a lot less light pollution. And that line is I-35. So that runs right <laughs> along the edge of the hill country. Um, so we often say that we're on the edge of night because um, the hill country communities are um, starting to experience that loss of the view of the Milky Way um, as Austin and San Antonio and San Marcos and New Braunfels all start pushing populations westward, um, uh, we're losing that that feature. So, so just the sort of the urgency of, of, of that loss is one reason that we do this work. And then there are other benefits of night sky preservation besides the heritage and the just human experience of being able to look up and see the stars um, and sort of the wonder that that inspires. Um, some additional reasons for night sky preservation uh, are um, the impacts that light pollution has on wildlife. Um, mm -hmm. So wildlife of all kinds. I mean, all, everything that lives in Texas, except maybe some of the cave creatures, are, uh, are evolved for dark nights. And, um, and so, you know, migratory birds that fly through Texas are known to navigate by the stars. Um, fireflies, which, uh, you know, were once abundant in Texas and still are in some places, um, require darkness to find one another and reproduce. Um, uh, even um, deer breeding cycles, when, when deer uh, mate uh, throughout the year, uh, is impacted by their experience of the changing length of day to night. Um, and so, uh, I could go on. So lo there's lots of wildlife <laughs> yeah. impacts uh, that um, that light pollution has. And so that's one reason. Human health is another reason. Um, you know, we are also evolved for dark nights. So um, when we're exposed to a lot of artificial light at night, that impacts the melatonin production in, in our bodies. And um, that uh, disrupts our sleep. And then that has all kinds of additional health effects. Um, and uh, and then just the, the character of our communities themselves um, and trying to make more beautiful places that aren't only beautiful by day, but are also beautiful by night, which just means having smart lighting. And that's a really important point, too, that, that Night Skies Preservation isn't about no lighting at all. It's about using artificial light wisely, using it where you need it, when you need it, making sure that it's shielded so that it's only pointing down to where it's needed. Um, and that there's not more than is needed. And, and like I said, it's only on when it's needed. Yeah, and we talked uh, about light pollution in episode um, 18, or I'm sorry, 13, if you're listening and you're interested in, in more information um, after this show. But there are just so many things I was shocked to hear about all the ways that it affects our bodies, our mental state. Um, and like you said, our connectedness to the world and to the universe and just kind of know being able to actually see the stars versus thinking it's just, a, you know, a canvas of gray or black or whatever mm -hmm. up there. <laughs> um, so that's really awesome that, that the Hill Country Alliance was started um, by a group of residents, basically. Right. And it's still going strong 15 years later. That shows a, a sense of commitment from that community and those folks, you know, that really want to preserve um, the world around them and, and what they what they, you know, call home. Um, so we've, we've talked about like what dark skies are, why they're important. Um, but you guys are specifically, you know, working on certification projects, correct, for some specific areas, dark sky certification. So can you talk a little bit about what that is and why 
folks might want to get certified? Sure. So um, there is, so usually when people talk about certifications or designations, um, they're referring to the International Dark Sky Association's Dark Sky, International Dark Sky Places Program. Um, so the International Dark Sky Association is based in Tucson, um, and they are charged with trying to preserve night skies all over the world. And, um, and we have a lot of activity and partnership with them here in Texas. Um, so they, they designate through their program, Dark Sky Communities, uh, and those are communities that have ordinances, outdoor lighting ordinances on the books, and that are also um, engaging their communities, their residents in educational activities and outreach activities and star parties and stuff to raise awareness. Uh, so those are dark sky communities. And in the Hill Country, uh, let's see, I think we have, we have four in the Hill Country, um, Dripping Springs, Horseshoe Bay, um, Wimberley and Wood Creek, which are kind of sister cities right next to each other, applied together, and Fredericksburg. Um, and I, to my knowledge, there are no others in Texas, although I'm not certain of that. Um, and then, and then they also, the IDA also designates dark sky parks. Um, so these are parks that have exceptionally dark skies and have exemplary lighting, so that folks who do visit these parks can see what good dark sky lighting looks like. And, um, and then that also emphasize uh, night skies in their um, educational programming. And we have, let's see, in the Hill Country, we have Enchanted Rock and we have South Llano River State Park. Um, mm -hmm. There are others in the Hill Country that are applying right now for that designation. I don't wanna leave anyone out, but I think that's all of the parks that we have in the Hill Country with that designation. Um, but there are other parts in Texas that have that designation. Maybe I'll, I'll hand that over to Chloe. Yeah, I'd love to jump in here. Um, that's a perfect kind of segue into that. Um, there are five state parks or state sites, state park sites that have the designation. Um, and then only one national park site in Texas. Um, but I think it's fun to look at that map and really show that like West, the Hill Country in West Texas can could have the ability to designate more. Um, and one thing that I think uh, the Hill Country Alliance did think was super interesting is not just talking about the culture and the benefit of it to na the nature and to people, but also it's kind of a beneficial part to the economy, if you really think about it, and tourism in Texas. And so that's how they want, one other way we're trying to work with the Hill Country Alliance is how can we help communities turn into a dark sky dark side community and help and help the community around the park right so Fredericksburg is right next to Enchanted Rock um, but then out, out in West Texas you have Fort Davis National Historical Site right next to Fort Davis and, and Alpine and, and Marathon and then you're looking at Golden Mountains and how are those communities none of them have an international dark skies designation but how can we start to get them rolling and see that it's not just beneficial to the wildlife and to nature and to their health, but it's also an economic draw. And I think especially after COVID, that could be really helpful um, to bring people back when it's safe to travel again, um, to have yeah, that really amazing draw. Yeah, because folks like amateur astronomers or people that just want to, you know, look with the naked eye or, or their telescope are, are going to seek those places out because they'll have a better view. and. Um, like you said, they, they need a place to stay, they need food to eat. So that is a great point that um, this drives tourism and all these benefits. It's like, what are the what are the downfalls here? <laughs> right. And especially, I think, after, um, you know, we're saying that you're thinking about I-35, right? Like, here's this limit of where you're seeing dark skies. And if that keeps growing and, and if the hill country is on the cusp on the edge of night, then then some of the last places to see the dark skies in Texas is going to be a hill country moving out west. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of like they have a, a unique opportunity to really capitalize on on this, right? So yeah, so it really does what is the downside? Um, and some of that in the downside, I think, is just the upfront cost. Um, so we're trying to find ways and partners and community members to work around that to help make it a possibility because in the long run, it's so valuable. Yeah, and I think too, there's just some misconceptions about, um, like you said, what it means to be a dark sky community it doesn't mean there's no light. Um, and, and sometimes people think more light means they're safer, light on 
um, in their storefront or something to deter criminals. But um, when we when we did our talk on light pollution, she said actually the opposite's you know correct because people don't want to go in when it's dark, and if it's lit up, then they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna seek it out. So so there's just a lot of I think educating that needs to be done with the community at large too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and the the tourism angle. I mean, it, actually, the the economic benefits are on two sides. So there's the tourism angle, which is really important. I'm glad that Chloe brought that up. Um, we talk about that a lot uh, with the communities where we work in the hill country. In the hill country, um, you know, it, within uh, within just two hours drive of Austin and San Antonio, or to flip that flip that around, within two hours drive of of Enchanted Rock. Um, you know, there are 4 million people living who can't see the Milky Way from where they live. So if they want to take themselves or their kids out to see the Milky Way and enjoy the stars for a night or two, um, the hill country is where they can go as long as the hill country preserves its night skies. And so that's, that's a, and, and actually the National Park Service um, conducted a study several years ago and found that, that um, families who stay overnight in a place, I mean, it's pretty intuitive, but what they're finding was that families who spend who stay overnight in a place spend uh, about four times as much as a family who just visits a place for the day. Um, and so that's that's a lot of opportunity for places like Blanco or Fredericksburg mm -hmm. or um, even Kerrville. Uh, and, and then the other side of the coin is the energy savings. So it's estimated that, um, that $2 billion annually in the US is really wasted, is spent on light shining where it's not intended. So light shining up into the sky or over into a neighbor's yard. Um, and in Texas, that's estimated to be uh, about $250 million for wow, Texas wow. per year. Uh, of, of wasted money on energy costs. So that's the other economic benefit. Yeah, you mentioned earlier different types of light. What are, um, I know there's a certain type of light for cities or, you know, mun municipalities or whatever. Uh, it, so, so what is that if, if a city's looking to transition to something that's more dark skies friendly? Well, right now, I mean, everyone is, is shifting or has shifted to LEDs. Um, because mm -hmm. of the, uh, the energy efficiency of LEDs and because we believe, we won't know for another 10 or 15 years, but we believe they require a lot less maintenance. I mean, the, the lifetime of an LED is typically estimated at uh, 15 uh, years or so, and hopefully that is how long they'll last before they, this, this first generation of LEDs that's being installed needs to be replaced. But so those are the reasons that that communities are shifting to LEDs. And LEDs also have um, some added benefits, uh, which include uh, more, uh, you, can, you can make some fine adjustments. So you can control them remotely. You can, um, you know, you can vary the output. So you can bring it down after hours to 25% output. For instance, um, I've seen some photos uh, at Big Bend National Park where they've installed um, lights at kiosks that are really dim at night until somebody approaches and then they can come on um, when there's somebody at that kiosk at night, say, who's arriving at the park after hours. Um, so LEDs have this kind of flexibility and this controllability, which is beneficial as well. The, the downside to LEDs are one, um, the, the color. So this is something that we talk about a lot in night skies preservation is, is the technical term we use is the correlated color temperature. Um, but that's sort of a needlessly complicated term to really just refer to the color of the light or the color content of the light. And the main thing here is how much blue wavelength um, there is. Now, the more blue wavelength there is in that light, um, the more white bright blue it will appear to the eye and the less there is the more amber it will appear um, generally leds have appear to be more white and blue they have more blue wavelength than some of the older say street light technology mm -hmm. or older incandescent light technology um, uh, but still you can get leds that have an appropriate level of blue wavelength um, and to port color Correlated color temperature is um, is measured in degrees Kelvin, 
Uh, and so what we always want to make sure people know is that they should be looking for lights that have 3000 degrees Kelvin of their correlated color temperature or CCT um, or less. So 3000 is the max and then down from there. So if you can get 2700 degrees Kelvin, that's even better than 3000 and below 2700 is even better. Um, and that when you go buy a, a light in the store, this is moving a little bit away from your question about municipalities, but just at a consumer level, if you go to the store to purchase an LED bulb for your front porch, any consumer um, uh, light that you buy at the store will have a lighting facts label on it, just like our food has nutrition facts labels on it. And in that label, there will be um, uh, indication of what the color temperature is. And so again, we just want people to, to buy products that have either 3000 le or less. So 2700 is better than 3000 and so forth. And the reason is, is that that, that blue wavelength um, in the light tells your body that it's daytime. So that's one reason in terms of the human health impacts. It tells your body that it's, it's, um, it's daytime because your body thinks it's seeing light from the blue sky. Uh, and also that blue wavelength scatters more in the atmosphere, so it creates more sky glow um, because it's going to scatter more and bounce off more particles in the atmosphere and then return to your eye and obscure your view of the stars. Well, I'm glad to hear that there are LEDs that um, are in the right wavelength because I had always heard, you know, LEDs are too bright, do, don't do LEDs on a large scale, do the like sodium based or uh, you know, the yellower lights, I guess, which some people don't like for other reasons, like you said, because the color or whatever. So, so well, I think I, I mean, I'll, personal, sorry to interrupt you personally, I, I think that, it, you know, if we had a world where we could have outdoor lighting that had the efficiency of an LED, but the color of an older technology, those more amber um, technologies and streetlights, that would be far better. But um, but most communities these days are shifting over to LEDs and for energy efficiency reasons. So that, you know, there's pros and cons to that for sure. Yeah, and it still has to be affordable so they can, you know, buy enough lights for the community, so. The most um, important thing, I'm sorry, the one more point on this, just that the most important thing is that it's shielded and that the light, regardless of how it's being made, uh, whether it's an LED, or a metal halide light um, that it be uh, fully shielded so that that light isn't shining uh, where it's not needed and certainly not up into the sky and not into the eyes of people who are driving or walking by. And often LEDs don't have as much shielding as they really should. LED street lights sometimes because LEDs are unidirectional by nature in that they don't, they only um, they're, 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 they are mounted to a plane, like a, like a computer, um, like a, like a computer board that you would have all kinds of, um, electronics on. And, um, so they can only shine, they can't really shine up, like a bulb will shine in every direction, but an LED won't. So often manufacturers don't put shields on them, but we do need to make sure that the, the fixtures that we get are fully shielded. Yeah. I want to add, add to that point really fast about it is important for the colors, but also it really is that shield. Uh, there's some really great pictures you can find online if you just Google like dark sky glare, you know, or glare from lights um, of an individual at their garage and they have that, you know, your typical light that's shining down might be motion censored or not, but it actually creates a glare. When the person puts their hand up to remove the glare, they can see a person standing behind in the darkness, but you can't because of the glare shining out. So going back to that safety piece, educational piece, that the glare isn't just bad for your health or bad for the environment. It's also negatively impacting your safety and your own house. So I'm just looking at that is incredibly interesting. And the shielding is so powerful. Yeah, and I know when I'm driving and a car with LED lights comes by, it's pretty blinding, like, if, especially if it's a really dark night, so. Um. So I'm just gonna jump in real quick. Um, I know we talked a lot about LEDs and what people can buy, and you know, that's the average person and how they can help with this problem. Is there anything else that residents or average person do to support your programs, um, talk more about the certification and how they could get involved. 
involved and help you guys out in that area. Go ahead, Chloe, if you want. Um, you can get off and I'll follow up. Okay. Um, yes, there's lots that folks can do. So, I mean, at the very individual level, of course, people can always um, take some time to evaluate their own lighting and see, uh, you know, are my lights shining out into the street where they might be um, uh, shining into the light, eyes of drivers? Are they shining up into the sky? Can I um, shield these lights? And sometimes that is as easy as getting, uh, I mean, some people go really uh, DIY with it and will get a coffee can and rig it up to create a light shield. And you can also, if you have like a front porch fixture that just essentially shows your whole light bulb there in a little mason jar, um, you can get a downward facing LED and that will only shine the light down and that's you know a three dollar bulb it's the same cost as any other bulb really um and so then your light will just be shining down so you can take care of the light on your property of course but if you want to be more involved than that there's lots of great ways to plug in so in the hill country um we are um supporting friends of the night sky groups uh, in counties across the Hill Country. Right now, there are seven such groups. So if you live in Blanco County or in Kerr County or Kendall County or Bandera County or Travis <laughs> or Hayes or Kamal, um, then just go online uh, onto Facebook and look for uh, Kamal County Friends of the Night Sky or you know the county that you live in. And, um, and if you don't live in one of those counties, but you live in the Hill Country, um, then reach out to us. You can email me, Cliff, that's my first name, C-L-I-F-F, -F, at hillcountryalliance.org, and I'll connect you to, um, to other people in your community who care about this issue. And, and then if you want, I'd, I'd help you start a Friends of the Night Sky group. So, um, you know, and then short of uh, uh, other ways to get involved um, are to give a presentation or to ask somebody like me uh, or like Chloe or somebody from the IDA. And I should mention that the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, has a Texas chapter that is active. And so that's another place. If you don't live in the Hill Country, then you can plug in to the Texas chapter of the IDA. Just Google that. Um, and, um, and then email the folks there. I know those people, they are very lovely and I'm involved with the Texas chapter as well. So that would be another way to get involved. And then any of these organizations could um, help arrange for a presentation to your local city council or to the Chamber of Commerce. At the Hill Country Alliance, um, we help people engage their city councils and their county commissioners courts on night sky preservation issues, but also chambers of commerce and schools. Um, we partner with chambers to create business recognition programs so that um, you know businesses in town that have good outdoor lighting can be recognized by the chamber and that can get written up in the newspaper. So these are just more ways to kind of spread a general awareness in the community. I think uh, when I hop onto that point, I think it's really interesting. And you, Jennifer asked this earlier, kind of like the municipal question. And it's like, there's lots of things you as an individual can do in your own house. And the IDA does have that certification. Um, you can look at like, getting your own home certified and get your own little certificate, which is really great and fun. Um, but it's that education piece I think is so huge because lots of cities actually have lighting ordinances, but their lighting ordinances either aren't really followed or they're not up to par to what they can, what could be. So I think going back to the resources that Cliff has, can provide with you with the, the Country Alliance, the ability to really talk to your city council, talk to your HOA, get that education awareness, I think it's gonna be really, really um, helpful. And same with the national park sites. There's those communities around Fort Davis, around LBJ uh, that could really benefit from having a dark skies lighting um, but they really need advocates and people to start talking and speaking up so turning to your city council person doing your own lighting talking to your neighbor get it as more as we can talk about it and get that information out here in podcasts like this and others people can realize the benefit and what they can do in their own backyard it's it's incredibly powerful and i and i, and I just like to also say that um that it's a really fun issue to work on. Um, yeah, and so yeah. if you're in your community and you're thinking, well, I don't know about engaging my city council, um, it doesn't need to be intimidating. And there's lots of people in Texas who, who would be happy to support you. But mm -hmm. like the, at the IDA, um, at the Texas chapter of the IDA or here at the Hill Country Alliance, 
But also, it's just, it's, it truly is a, a very non-controversial issue. Um, nobody is for light pollution. And, um, and so, if, if you've never been involved in, with your city council before, this is a pretty easy issue to engage them on. And, um, and like I said, there's lots of support networks um, for folks who want to get engaged. And of course, it's not just the city council, like I said, um, or the school is another great um, place to engage your community. Um, and, and also just in your neighborhood. Yeah, great. definitely a neighborhood or a, a community venture there. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> okay, so um, I was just gonna ask, what is your favorite location, like dark sky location in Texas? And then what is your favorite in the world if you've been able to travel? That's a great question. I would say in Texas, right now, I'm gonna say, so hmm, Big Bend National Park, if you get the opportunity to go out there or the Big Bend Ranch State Park, those are two beautiful places. It's actually one of the darkest locations you can see, uh, the night sky. Um, typically you can see over about 200, 2000, I'm sorry, stars a night, uh, which is an average. And in most communities you can see about um, 50 in, in when you're looking up. So it's kind of magical to be out there. But I wanna make a plug for Guadalupe Mountains, because I think they have beautiful night skies and they're incredibly gorgeous out in West Texas, but they're having a little bit of trouble um, with some, you know, oil and gas development. So that's also one thing that NPCA and the McDonald Observatory is working with some of those oil and gas um, developments to, again, not turn off the lights, just turn them down, um, because if that's a beautiful place to see the night sky, but if there's lighting and glare and you can see it on the horizon, um, it ruins that view. That's one in a lifetime. Um, so I highly recommend going out to both of those. And if you're interested in kind of advocating for them, I'm very happy to work with you and connect you on that. And you can look for the Marfa lights while you're out that way too. Yes. <laughs> I know that's a big part of the reason McDonald located their observatory out there too, is because it was, you know, so little light pollution. So, right. Um, yeah, Cliff, what, what is your favorite spot? Well, I love seeing the night sky all over the hill country. Uh, you know, it's great um, as long as you get away from Austin and San Antonio. I mean, I've had wonderful nights looking at the stars in, in Austin even. Um, and there's an observatory on top of, uh, on top of a building uh, at UT Austin um, that they open up a couple times a month in pre-COVID times and hopefully in post-COVID times as well. Um, so, you know, you can always have fun outside at night, but, um, I am on, uh, the board of the Friends of Lost Maples State Natural Area, and, um, that park is working on, um, their application to become a International Dark Sky Park with the IDA, and I've had many, many wonderful nights there, um, enjoying the stars, too. They have wonderful skies. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there's so many places that we can go to, to enjoy nature like that. Sorry, Jen. Now, I was just going to say, is there anywhere outside of Texas that you've been that you just really love and you would recommend? I'm a Texas girl. I have not. <laughs> I love, I think I love my state almost too much. Just kidding. There's no way you can ever love Texas too much. Um, segue, I, I always hear a joke from our colleagues that live in the Northeast that the only reason we like Texas so much is because you can't get anywhere else, which is probably true. As it's um, 10 hours either way you drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But no, I, I think uh, for me, at least the state is so magical. I think, you know, Cliff, you have mentioned it. There's so many places, even in your own backyard, just it's such a gorgeous state to see. The night sky to hear some of the wildlife um, to go to the beach and see the stars or to see the sea turtles and that wildlife that depends on the night skies you can go to the desert you can go to the hill country you can go to the piney woods um, out in big thicket national preserve and do moonlight walks um, or go up to albate quarry in the panhandle um, and go to a national monument of flint's 
where there used to be the native indigenous indigenous tribes and see like what it looked like to be in that community and be in Texas. And so there's just so much to offer in our state that I want to have to experience it all. And then I'll go somewhere else. I would give a shout out to Arizona. I mentioned this in the last show, but I uh, had to pull over once driving off of the, you know, the interstate of all places that was brightly lit. The stars were just so beautiful <laughs> and, and, you know, prolific out there. But that's kind of the direction of West Texas, you know, and I have to agree that West Texas is unlike anything else in the state. So, um, yeah. I would just encourage folks that if they're driving around at night, wherever they are, that they find a safe place to pull over and <laughs> just take in the night for a few minutes because uh, it's beautiful. And, um, you know, if you're just driving from place to place, sometimes we forget to enjoy it. And so I just encourage folks, wherever they are, to um, not forget to enjoy it and, and get out there. As Neil deGrasse Tyson says, keep looking up. <laughs> Jen, do you have any places you would plug in or outside of Texas? Uh, so I was fortunate enough to go to Alaska and <laughs> it was a work trip, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was able to, to see the Martha Light. The, the green, oh. The Northern Royalist. Yeah. The Northern Royalist. Yeah. The Northern Anyways, um, but it's very rare. Like, you have to have, like, no clouds, and it has, it's only certain times of the year. But, yeah, we got to see, like, a little bit of it. So that was, that was always nice. But you can visit other places <laughs> and see it there as well. You don't have to go to Alaska. No, I bet that was magical. You just have to see the la you just have to get at the right latitude line, I guess. But yeah, I was um, I was poles. for work, so. But, yeah. Lucky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm kind of curious. Have either of you heard anything about like the health benefits of just like staring at the sky and you know being outside and kind of taking that in? Is there any science behind it? Have you heard anything about that? about that as well. Yeah, I'd say absolutely. Um, in particular for the night sky, I don't I don't know um, any direct correlation for research, but I know there's lots of research and you probably heard of you know nature RX and just the idea of the health benefits that um, being out in nature can really bring, how it can lower your stress level, it can um, clear your mind, make you more creative, help you sleep better. So there's really a lot of research on what it really means just to be outdoors. Um, and I could see that, you know, increasing with you just being able to spend more time outside, especially under the stars and taking that opportunity to really relax and let your adrenaline levels drop. Um, so even though actually the national park sites, we encourage a lot of legislation and bills that look at therapeutic values of being in nature and in national park sites. I'm going to encourage what that looks like for veterans or for therapy um, because being in nature is just found to be incredibly therapeutic. And so if we can start encouraging that more often um, and, and go people have people go out camping to and go hiking. So just spend their day and their nights in nature and in a park site to see a sunset and then to see the stars. It, it's they found that um, the health benefits is um, increased and there's more and more research coming out, but we support it um, for NPCA and the national parks because we think it's valuable. You get your vitamin N. Mm -hmm. Cliff, would you add anything to that or? I don't know of any science that connects um, you know, besides the health impacts of light pollution, um, which have been studied, and, and, and I didn't mention this, but, you know, they found that people who are exposed to really high amounts of, of artificial light at night, because they work, say, in a hospital where there's a lot of light on throughout the night, um, that there's higher incidence of um, breast and prostate cancer um, in people who are exposed to a lot of light at night. Now, the, the flip side of that, in terms of the health benefits of taking in the Milky Way and the star-filled sky. Um, I haven't 
um, heard about any of that science, but I would love to, and it wouldn't really surprise me to find out that there are health benefits. Um, because like I said, we know that we're evolved just like all of the other um, creatures that live on this planet with us um, to have dark nights. And so that's um, you know what's gonna make our bodies um, healthy and feel good. It kind of makes you wonder um, what humans before electric light was invented, you know, what their bodies may have um, done differently or how it may have reacted. Since they didn't have access to this kind of light, that's kind of an interesting um, game to play, I guess. Yeah. Plus, that's why I think camping is so interesting, especially if you, like, are really thoughtful about not having your lamp on or headlights. Like, well, the sun goes down, like, what else are we going to do? It's like sit around a fire until it goes out and then go to bed, you know? So if you do that, can you do it for a week and see how does that make you feel? It's kind of nice when you wake up and the sun's up because it's bright outside and you don't have curtains to close, you know? So you're like, well, I guess I'll just get up now. So it's kind of fun to try it out. So if you ever have that opportunity, I highly recommend going to camping in some of these our state parks or national parks nearby and, and having that experience and seeing what that feels like. Maybe your body reacts really well to it and something that you know that you mean you might need as a health benefit every once in a while. For sure. Definitely recommend camping. I'm a big fan. Jen and I have been a couple times together and yeah, we're all about that life. <laughs> well, um, Jen, did you have any other questions or anything else you want to bring up? I think we covered it all. Um, I do want to do one thing before we move on because you can't talk about Texas Night Sky without singing the song, right? Uh, the stars at night are big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. Thank you. If you're not in Texas and you ever sing those, that line, it's like the quick clap. It's, it's like in our DNA or something, you know. You can't yeah. just not do it. <laughs> well, awesome. With that, I'm going to move us on. Um, well, first, are there any resources you'd suggest for our listeners, whether it's other podcasts, um, documentaries, books, anything you want to share? I think the IDA website, um, so International Dark Sky Association, uh, if you will look them up, their website has some resources, lots of resources on light pollution in your own, in your home, what you can do, parks in the area. Um, I think they're really good. And they have the chapters you can look at going to. So for me, that's a good place to start um, if you want to look at just dark skies um, and kind of all that information. And I would also invite people to our website, hillcountryalliance.org. You can also put in hillcountrynightskies.org and that'll take you right to our Night Skies page. And we've just redone the whole Night Sky portion of our website. So we'd be really excited to have lots and lots of visitors there. And we're also um, getting ready to launch the very first annual Hill Country Night Sky Month. Um, so this will be a month-long celebration this October um, where communities will be um, doing events. Now, because of COVID, a lot of these events are going to be online. Everything's going to be COVID safe, of course. But it's a month for communities to be updating policies and doing big lighting retrofit projects at the library or at the ball field um, or wherever in the community. And then also for communities to... Um, to celebrate and learn more about our night skies and how we can preserve them. So that's this October um, uh, in the Hill Country, and you can learn more about it at hillcountrynightskies.org. Great. Great. Okay, okay, well, we're going to jump into our uh, green life hacks, which is just something that we've recently discovered or that we've been doing for a long time, whether it's a product or an um, a practice that helps us live a little more sustainably. So, Jen, would you like to go first? <laughs> um, I guess with the COVID situation and everything going on, I'm just spending more time outside. Um, teleworking from home has been amazing. So, <laughs> I guess my green life hack is, is to figure out a way to telework like full time because it's awesome. I, I don't really have any products or anything to share today, but I would just highly recommend everybody get outside, go camping, see the sky, 
um, you know, get a little bit of sunshine on you every day, go for a walk. Um, you know, if you're able to and you're teleworking, you're, you know, saving time, not having to get dressed and drive to work every day. So um, use that time wisely and do some self-care and get outdoors. Well, Great I would work. second that. I'll second that and I'll just add, um, just turn the lights off if you're not using them. It's a pretty low tech hack. Yeah, especially right now, like I used to have my lights out, my outdoor lights on a timer. And since I'm never out at night anymore or ever, <laughs> I just turn them off all the time. I'm like, I don't need my outside lights on if I'm never going to be coming home late. So Amen. keep your lights off, guys. Chloe, what is your green life hack? It's a dark sky that I'd have to agree. It's, it's very easy just to um, turn off the lights if you can. Um, and see how long you can go without turning them on in the evening. Um, and definitely turn off the porch light um, if you don't have that. Um, and, and look at some of those um, really fun ways to, Cook I mentioned it, uh, to make your own shield. Uh, so I actually have some lights around my outdoor balcony, but I realized that when I walked around that they shine kind of outside. So I drink a lot of, you know, Tobo Chico and sparkling water. So I got some of the cans and was able to poke holes in the cans and put them up there. So now I kind of shine little down, little lights down, which is really fun. And so I think just using what you have in your house, I think during COVID, right? Uh, we're all home. We like, we like being home. So how can you make it more comfortable with the things you have and not buy more things? So I think if you have some of those aluminum cans, see how you can kind of turn them safely into shields around your house. So if you do have, um, like Cliff mentioned, the kind of lights that are like glass, or maybe you mentioned um, mm -hmm. glass on the outside and just see through, could you just paint the outside of those? Or yes. Does that work the same way? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You can paint them if you have that. I think Cliff was just recommending there are some light bulbs that do just shine straight down if you don't want to have to change the glass light bulb. Um, but yeah, I actually paint ours. So okay. ours is painted. And I may have to try that because yeah. that's what I have right now. <laughs> um, well, my green life hack, I'll do one that's that's kind of related to what we're doing too. Um, I am terrible with constellations. I can see Orion and that's about it. And I have um, tried my best to learn them, but they all just look the same to me. So I would suggest to folks who are like me and constellation impaired um, to download one of the constellation apps to their phone because they use your GPS to kind of make a picture for you and kind of show you what's what and you can see some of the planets if they're in line but you can also like go down into the earth and it'll show you what the constellations are on the other side of the planet it's pretty cool so um, if you yeah if you want to get out there and explore the night sky you know get one of those apps I know it kind of defeats the purpose if you're trying to do a dark sky but do it for a little bit and then, you know, turn it off. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's still, it's still got to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. And um, let's see, uh, Jen, where can we find you online, if anywhere besides here? Uh, as usual, you have exclusive rights to me. <laughs> okay. Um, Cliff had to jump off, but he's already plugged the Hill Country Alliance, and I know that they're on all the social media. If you want to look them up there as well, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Uh, Chloe, where can we find you online? Yes, and um, people can go to npca.org backslash Texas, and they'll find our specific Texas page with some other information on how we're working with our national parks. And then you can actually sign up for alerts. So right now we've mentioned a little bit how we're trying to work with our national parks to become more dark sky certified and what that'll look like. And some of that's going to be some needed community support. Um, so we'd love to see some people to write some letters, letters of support for our parks. Um, and there's actually an opportunity. They can look up my park story. And if you have an experience with being in the national parks or a park and experiencing a dark sky, we'd love for you to share your story on the my park story NPCA page. Um, Cause it's kind of fun to collect all the stories of the night sky and, and share those to show that community support for this effort. Um, so either of those, you can Google us and you'll find that would be great. Cool. And do you have to live in that community to support the park? 
Oh, no, not at all. Um, I think the beauty of, of the national parks um, is that they can speak to anybody, and, and that's the idea that nature, cultural heritage, and history, we want anyone to find their park story and anyone to find a connection to, this, to the park. So um, having community support outside of the parks is even more powerful to show that yeah. they cross borders, they cross boundaries. Um, so we'd love for people in Texas, out of Texas, out of the United States, anywhere to give us that support for our dark skies and our national parks. For sure, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I can be found on uh, here on Sustainably Geeky, on our parent show, Epically Geeky, our book club show, Marginally Geeky, and Creatively Geeky. We do a lot of geekies. And um, also on social media at Het's Gonna Be Me. And then um, you can find this show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, of course, anywhere you listen to podcasts, uh, we ask that you subscribe or like us or, you know, give us a thumbs up, uh, you know, five-star rating, whatever they ask you for. Um, please support us so that we can continue to be out there and give you guys great content. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day.